Welcome to the Institute of Humanities in Africa doctoral seminar series, where these sessions are designed to provide an introduction to the intellectual grounding and guidance on the practical tools of the doctoral journey. My name is Angelique Thomas, and I'm a doctoral fellow within Yuma. This seminar is streaming on Facebook, and you will be able to find the recording of this session on the Yuma YouTube channel. As an additional note, many Zoom users have experienced the unfortunate occurrence of Zoom bombing. To mitigate these issues and to try and reduce the risk as much as possible, we ask that all participants kindly change their profile name to their full name and affiliation or pop those details into the chat box. You might find yourself temporarily placed in the waiting room otherwise. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting one of our own postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Chike Z Uzweg Punam, on the very important topic of dealing with mental health in doctoral work. While this topic may resonate with many and is incredibly important, we acknowledge the sensitivity of this topic area and we would like to offer a trigger warning. Our seminars provide an open space for the critical and civil exchange of ideas. Some content in this session may include topics that some participants may find sensitive and traumatizing, linked to mental health, mental illness, and emotional well-being. I ask that all participants I ask that all participants help create an atmosphere of mutual respect and sensitivity. We will also be offering some links and contact resources in the chat should anyone need support. As we begin, I'd like to offer an introduction to our guest speaker. Chikezi is a postdoctoral research fellow at Yuma. He holds a PhD in media studies focusing on digital media and young people from the University of Cape Town Center for Film and Media Studies. Earlier, he obtained an MEC in mass communication from Nandi Azikiwe University in Nigeria. He has a demonstrated trajectory of working in the higher education industry in Nigeria and South Africa as a researcher, teacher, and youth mentor for almost a decade. Chikezi serves as an editorial assistant to African Journalism Studies and Annals of the International Communication Association, both published by Routledge. He is a 2019 Fellow of the Oxford of the Oxford Media Policy Institute at Oxford University. And in 2017, he was named one of Africa's 100 brightest young minds. His research, his research interests include digital media and young people, digital cultures, political and health communication, and popular culture in Africa. He has published widely in these areas since 2013. Chikazi, we are thrilled to have you and we're excited for your talk on this very important topic. I will now hand over to you. Yes, the topic of mental health is one that is very near and dear to me. So thank you, Angelique Thomas, for that introduction and the invitation from you and uh, Dominic Sonder, uh, who have been or organizing and hosting for us. In us. Thank you to all who have joined us today. I would like to begin by quoting a man, the managing director of a marketing chain in the UK. Her name is Cathy Leeson. And she said, we need to stop glamorizing overworking, please. The absence of sleep, good diet, exercise, relaxation, and time with friends and family is not something to be applauded. Too many people wear their, wear their burnout as a badge of honor, and that needs to change. And you find that we live in a postmodern neoliberal world that glamorizes and glorifies and prioritizes hard work, performance, excellence, and productivity. Of course, the idea of hard work, performance, excellence, and productivity are not bad in themselves. In fact, they could ensure a well-functioning society whose members feel a sense of purpose and achievement in their life's work. However, the push for people to work and uh, the push for people to work and work hard, constantly produce results, succeed at all costs, compete for positions and promotions, and fit into demanding work schedules and professional standards, leave many of us burnt out, exasperated, stressed beyond limits, and struggle with our mental well-being. Ours is a capitalist, fast-paced world that if you snooze, you lose. The more worrisome issue is that much of society do not have 
nor encourage enough conversation around mental health, including informal spaces. In many professional circles, including, the, uh, including academia, the topic of mental health is one that is less discussed, almost assuming a taboo topic. There seems to be shame and silence wrapped around the issue of people's struggles with their mental health and the lack of space, safe spaces in many formal settings for people to engage on this issue has left many struggling even more and unable to access the help that they need to navigate life. We know enough to know that if we are to function maximally as human beings, we must prioritize our physical, spiritual, and mental health. The COVID-19 pandemic has also in many ways exacerbated people's struggles with mental health, with a world that is facing fatigue from lockdowns, restrictions, remote working and learning, and just mental stress from all of the frenzy that is going on. The ongoing Olympics in Tokyo has recently brought the issue of mental health in professional spaces back to the front burner. Over the past few weeks, we've seen that six Olympians led by Simon Beals started to raise awareness and to change conversation about mental health while bravely opening up about their mental health issues and even some withdrawing from the race. These athletes are showing the world just how important mental health matters as much as physical health. Until recently, these athletes' mental health never seemed to come into discussion. Why should it? Why should it matter when the capitalist and neoliberal world has routinized and normalized a toxic sense of always doing well, of what Nigerians like to call suffering and smiling, succeeding against all odds, performance indices, and just sheer unhealthy competition? And some of the Olympians themselves remind us, and I quote some of the things that they had to say. We also, I quote, we also have to focus on ourselves because at the end of the day, we are human too. We have to protect our mind and our body rather than just go out there and do what the world wants us to do. I quote another, another statement. I do hope that people can relate and understand that it is okay to not be okay. And it is okay to talk about it. There are people who can help and there is usually light at the end of any tunnel. Now, in much of my life, I have prided myself as being a hard worker. In fact, I took pride in telling people how busy my life was rather than how much I played or rested. Much early in my journey, I got introduced into this academic business. You know, I was right from my MSc days. I started researching and writing papers, lecturing, going for conferences, publishing. And I must admit that I had the good fortune of having had mentors who pushed me to unleash in potentials that I did not know I had. And one of the mantras that I grew into academia with, drummed into me by those mentors, were statements like, Hard work does not kill, you know, the reward for hard work is even more work. But while, while this culture of hard work paid off tremendously, had also suffered from the debilitating impact of stress and burnout. With little knowledge about what it means to struggle mentally and what to do to get help, I continued to trudge on while suppressing the mental stress I suffered. This went on for a long time. And it was not until I began my PhD journey that I, I, came to, I came face to face with a problem. And I quickly realized that this was something I could no longer wish away. I had to face the demons myself. As a fresh PhD candidate in the humanities at UCT, I found very little community of fellow doctoral students in my department or similar spaces with whom I could share the journey. While there are institutional channels that support students through workshops, especially through the postgraduate office, it felt very lonely to find that there, there were very few community reciprocity for PhD students to come together and support each other. The problem with the lack of safe, safe spaces and avenues for conversations around mental health for postgrads 
is a bigger sin, uh, symptom of the lack of kindness, generosity, and vulnerability in intellectual spaces. And the lack of this in academia also mirrors the society's prioritization of toxic forms of hard work, excellence, performance, and productivity. And the consequence of this is the perpetuation of academia as this kindless, aggressive, adversarial competitive space, often extolling totally, uh, um, uh, uh, toxic excellence and performance above well being, above generosity, humanness, and conviviality. To what extent does academia make space for kindness? How can kindness and generosity be mobilized as a democratic and healing tool in intellectual spaces? And when we embrace intellectual generosity and kindness, I think it invites us to treat ourselves and others with humanity and care and vulnerability. What I'm saying is nothing new to us. In fact, there are ongoing conversations, but not enough around this issue in intellectual spaces. But there is often the unintended problem of always assigning the problem to an invisible them, as though them are the problem and not us. I think we need to begin to ask what our individual role or determined effort is in opening up intellectual spaces for conversations around mental health among academics and among advanced students, such as PhD students and even master's students. I consider the PhD journey as a lot of things. In fact, I think it's a, it's a roller coaster ride because one minute you are raring to go, you are full of enthusiasm and courage, and the next minute you are depressed, you're confused and full of doubt. And this is the experience of many, whether you're in Africa, you're in Europe or Asia or the Americas. We know that there are many factors that could trigger doctoral students' mental health. These range from funding worries, uh, inability to cope with tight schedules and deadlines, the pandemic now, supervision problems, et cetera. And it can be a very lonely isolation-induced journey. I experienced excruciating mental health issues throughout the journey. Indeed, the mental health of, of uh, postgraduate students, especially doctoral students, is not engaged enough in academic spaces. And it is worse when you are, when you are like me, like I was during my days, an international student who uh, is an, in an unfamiliar terrain and away from family and loved ones. And I went through a triple bout of depression, anxiety, and loneliness that nobody could understand but me. So in general, I think there are two main factors that I could attribute the mental health struggles experienced by PhD students to. The first is the near absence of kindness, generosity, and vulnerability within the neoliberal post-colonial academia that I have alluded to before. The second is the isolation factor. The consequence of the former is the perpetuation of academia as a space where people are skeptical of kindness and compassion and showing vulnerability. Instead of seeing these as very necessary human virtues that should be encouraged, we see them as weaknesses. The academia then invariably becomes this place where masochism and aggression are encouraged. Academia becomes this bloodless adversarial competitive space where well-being, generosity, humanness, and conviviality are less praised and taken seriously. On the other hand, the isolation factor stems from the idea that the doctoral student is an advanced student and therefore should work independently without without needing much micromanaging or supervision. And it is even worse for some disciplines where PhD candidates do not undertake coursework. And I think, I imagine that if, you're, if, if your PhD is in the natural sciences or engineering fields, that it will, it will usually involve uh, spending time working in a lab, and this can afford you the opportunity to be surrounded by people with whom you can 
have lunch, coffee, and talk about your research. But if there are uh, science or engineering students in the audience, I would like to hear from them whether they suffer less from isolation than others. But of course, I know that with the pandemic, that this is tough either way. And then in the humanities and social sciences and others, you will find that people spend most of their time on the research journey alone. They either work out of, the, out of a library at home, meeting their supervisors once in a while, etc. And the, the consequence then is a host of issues, such as people feeling lonely, depression, suicide ideations, suicides, anxiety, mental stress, and other health issues, and even imposter syndrome. I think at this point, you might be asking what can help? I think the solution begins or should begin with you. You could start by joining or creating support or writing groups in your department, in the faculty, or even in the university. And if you do not meet one when you begin your doctoral journey, create one. Now, remember that the solution to changing the status quo does not rest in the invisible them but also in us. I believe that social connection is important. So I would say, have a social life. Begin to get familiar with such mantras as you are not your PhD. There is life outside the PhD life. So have some hobbies and pursue them. Make friends outside your field. Friendships are vital for mental health. I like how uh, Dorothy Rowe writing on the importance of friendships for mental health says, and I, I, I quote, human beings are social animals. If we live completely on our own, we become very strange. We start to lose the ability to distinguish what goes on inside us, our thoughts and feelings, and what goes on in the world around us. And it is, it is other people who maintain that distinction, end of quote. So I think that social relationships can help to release oxytocin, which is known as the bonding hormone that is released when we feel connected to people that we love and care about. I would say get active through physical exercises. You can run, you can do yoga, cardio boxing, have a gym routine, go salsa dancing, go for hikes, hiking, anything that makes you sweat and not think about your thesis. Physical exercises help to release endorphins and endorphins are the brain's natural painkillers. They reduce stress and increase pleasure. There are other things you can do to get active, such as going for a walk, doing some cardio, practicing meditation, getting some sunshine. These range of activities help to release serotonin, which is the mood stabilizer that improves sleep, reduces anxiety and increases happiness. Have an open and honest conversation with your supervisor about your mental health. Do not be afraid to ask for help. And I know that we live in a world that makes asking for help look like weakness, helplessness or dependence. And we are sometimes scared to, to death to let this be seen or thought about us. But I say, Ask for help when you need it. Dare to be human. Practice self-kindness, positive self-talk and self-care. Sometimes the most, product, uh, the most productive thing that you can do is rest or take a break. And please do it unapologetically without shame or guilt. Because as Socrates reminds us, beware of the barrenness of a busy life. I will also say to get rid of the perfectionist mentality because your PhD is not supposed to be a perfect piece of academic work or endeavor. And if you consider a PhD as an apprenticeship, one that signals a beginning rather than, an, you know, rather than a destination. Now, I remember posting, uh, pasting these words on my door during my PhD and I was constantly reminded that, I quote, a good PhD is a finished 
thesis. A great PhD is a published thesis. A perfect PhD is neither. Aim to finish and you can finish. Doing the things that you enjoy, like listening to music, eating your favorite food, getting a good night's sleep and completing a small task every day, no matter how small it is, help to release, you know, it helps you to release the dopamine, which is the feel good neurotransmitter that drives your brain's reward system. And that can do you some good. Get professional help. Please do not underestimate the importance of seeking professional help for your mental health. Psychotherapy or uh, talk therapy helps to relieve the suffering and the confu uh, uh, confusion experienced with every mental health struggle. This could be done virtually or in person, individually or in group or with family. So find out what the provision is from your university on how to access mental health resources, such as psychotherapy. And if you can afford it on your own, you can see your own personal uh, psychotherapist for as long as you want. Another form of professional help that I have found useful is medications. When you see your doctor and talk to them about the symptoms you're experiencing, they can recommend anxiety medications that could help you function effectively. And you don't have to take this forever. One thing I know for sure is this, there is help for you when you're struggling with mental health issues. But this help is accessible to only those who acknowledge the situation and open up about it to people who matter and people who will help them. Spirituality, I think spirituality can be important. I strongly believe so. Many of us consider ourselves spiritual beings, but often you find that academics think that, academics uh, tend to think that to talk about or show your spirituality will make you sound uncool. And I know that it is not only academics that do this, but why shy away from engaging strongly or unapologetically with your spirituality? when you consider it useful to your life. And I'm not talking about religion or doctrinal beliefs as much as I'm referring to the inner consciousness that connects you with your soul and God or higher power, which makes you make meaning of the world and who you are. I like the way Oprah Winfrey said it about spirituality. If you lose sight of your spirituality, it's easy to get lost in the world. Unplug from social media and manage your time more wisely. I began what I call social media detox during my PhD. And by this, I meant that from time to time, I do a digital cleanse. I still do it now. I do a digital cleanse to restore my humanity. That's the way I see it. And I define a digital cleanse as a deliberate, conscious, and self-managed effort to regularly step away from technology and social media in order to find ourselves again. With regular uncontrolled social media use, it becomes very easy to sometimes lose ourselves in the moment, to waste a bit of time, to become blind to some of the important aspects of our everyday life, to lose sight of the beauty in our physical world. My supervisor was instrumental to my being able to manage my mental health. She was the one person who first inspired me to take physical exercises seriously. And I registered at, at, at a gym, started running and hiking, and you know, I took up some other outdoor activities. And I still do them till today because they saved my life. When you normalize having an open conversation about your mental health with your supervisor, it helps to take, to take the pressure off, to create space for vulnerability and kindness to flow. Some people will argue that supervisors should not become your therapist because they are not equipped to assist with these sort of issues. But I think that sort of argument entirely misses the point. 
Your supervisor is your, is your best body during your research journey. Supervisors also must not shy away from welcoming their students' concerns with mental health. I believe that if academia is remade to become a place where kindness and generosity and vulnerability are encouraged, some supervisors may find it easier to welcome such open conversations with their students and therefore remind them of available options for dealing with mental health. I remember this one time I was talking from writer's blog and I had yet to send my supervisor a draft as we had agreed on. I sent her an email, you know, berating myself and promising to deliver soon. She responded and simply said, and I quote, be kind to yourself. Take a break from the writing and enjoy some of the other things that you love doing. And then ease back into the writing process. And that was the kindest and the most profound thing anyone would ever tell me during the PhD journey. With that, I felt seen and understood in a way that was refreshingly liberating. That kindness was like adrenaline that rather pushed me into breaking free from my perfectionist bubble and writer's block. And a few weeks after that, I was back on my grind and I wrote every day until I submitted the thesis. Now, beyond the role that supervisors can play, departments and faculties have an even broader role to play by making possible the establishment of communities of reciprocity, whereby postgraduate students are free to connect and talk about their journey. It does help to know that no one, um, it does help a lot to know that one is not alone. When PhD students speak the truth of their own experiences to one another, it, it makes their truth universal. And one of my proudest achievements during my um, PhD was that I resuscitated uh, my department's uh, postgraduate network and successfully organized two postgraduate uh, colloquia where we presented our work to each other and the faculty and received helpful uh, feedback. We also stayed connected through WhatsApp group and I'm happy that that group is still alive and well till today. Many universities have outlets and resources to help their students manage mental health. However, sometimes I wish that there is a sort of a more personalized network whereby departments and faculties bring these resources closer to the students. And maybe this is in place, but sometimes I think that universities just send out emails and information about mental health as a sort of obligation that they have to fulfill. But within departments and faculties, I constantly feel that there should be other more personalized and interconnected levels of networks with mentors and coaches who are active at localized levels that will bring these resources closer to the students in a way that makes, uh, makes it more easy, more ordinary, you know, more understood and more accessible to the students. I guess, all of this takes us back to the questions I posed earlier. To what extent does academia make space for kindness? How can kindness and generosity be mobilized as a democratic and healing tool in intellectual spaces? Can universities treat kindness as a form of resistance and transformation within the context of the neoliberal or post-colonial academia? In concluding, I believe that until we embrace intellectual generosity and kindness, we will not be able to treat ourselves and others with humanity, with care and vulnerability. On 27 July, 2021, in the heat of the mental health crisis that erupted among some athletes at the Olympics, Piers Morgan, a British journalist wrote on Twitter, and I quote, our mental health issues now the go to ex now the go to excuse for any poor performance in elite sports. What a joke! Just admit you did badly, made mistakes, and will strive to do better next time. K 
kids need strong role models, not this nonsense. Again, this mirrors the world that glamorizes, glorifies and prioritizes hard work, performance, excellence and productivity at all costs. And one which disparages you for failing, for even showing the slightest indication of weakness or vulnerability, often in relation to your mental health. And as at yesterday, Piers Morgan continues to tweet about this toxic sense of achievement and performance. His latest, one of his latest tweets was, and I quote, get back out there, Simon. Don't get sucked into all the weak, woke, failure-loving Twitter nonsense. I would like to close by reading from a beautiful line by author Jeff Brown. And I dedicate these lines to all uh, PhD students and those doing postgraduate work. We are all tired. Really, we are. It's a hard road but it's also a beautiful one. Perhaps we expect too much from ourselves and from others. Perhaps humanity can only make slow progress, like an inch one. Perhaps we need to celebrate how far we have come and rest more and relish the simple pleasures and look for love everywhere. There is a river near where I live it meanders slowly, peacefully. It does not ask itself why it isn't an ocean or a raging river or some other thing. It just surrenders to what is. Maybe we just need to surrender more to who we are. I think I will lie down tomorrow beside the river and take a rest and sweet surrender. I quite like the way a PhD student I know, a friend, chose to describe herself on her Twitter profile. She says, a PhD candidate is not who I am. It is what I do with some of my time. I am many things. My prayer is that PhD and research uh, students everywhere be many things and may they find the gift of living, living fully while getting the help that they need for their health. And may their journey be full of simple pleasures and sweet surrender. Thank you. Thanks so much for this talk, Chikizia. I especially appreciated the way in which you wove the academic with your own personal experience. As a doctoral fellow myself, I find the way in which you've nudged all of us to consider the near absence of kindness, generosity, and vulnerability, to be key in how we approach our work, but also our fellow colleagues who may be experiencing struggles, who may be experiencing struggles that we know very little about. Um, I will now, at this point, ask if there's anyone who would like to ask a question or comment on the presentation. You can either raise your hand on the Zoom feature or pose your question or comment in the chat should you feel that you are more comfortable to do so. Um, Aza, I see your hand. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Chikaze. Like it's really great, and your talk brought back memories, you know, <laughs> from from uh, yeah, from uh, our PhD journey. And I think also one of the things that was helped me is to really get rid of what I call toxic toxicity, like people who are toxic in your life or anything that could just you know like bring, I mean, even if it was your supervisor, I mean, for me, I got rid of a supervisor, not just anyone, it's not just a friend, you know, so, so I think it's very important to just evaluate, evaluate and um, see, as you said, I mean, it's the, 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 the help starts with us helping our own selves, you know, and making um, very bold decisions about um yeah our situations like i remember i i mean i was serving for a while at um as a junior federal rep so i had 
to deal with a lot of also issues of people representative, junior fellow representative in, in my graduate school. So I also had to deal with a lot of other people, other, other postdoctoral fellows who are um, going through a lot of problems and a lot of also psychological issues. And I had people who actually almost committed uh, suicide, you know, and I had also people who were admitted to hospitals. So as you said, it's, it's a whole it's a whole system. I mean, we need also an institutions that help, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, starting a conversation, I mean, it's now I like this idea of graduate schools, especially when um, we have a lot of PhD students who can come together and form a, a, a sort of um, a body that, that where they, they can share the, their experiences and everything like this is this is very helpful. And instead of just being in your like your faculty and just being with your supervisor, you know, you still also need to be with with other colleagues who are going through the same problems, you know, because as much I mean, my super my second supervisor was really helpful. Like I can't I mean, the way I, I, I can't have words to describe the, the sort of support he gave me, you know. Um, but um, as I said, it was like for me, there was the fundamental thing in my in my PhD is just to get rid of my supervisor. <laughs> my supervisor. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah, just deal with toxicity, so toxicity in in your in your PhD and mm. on on different levels. Yeah. Mm. That's all my what I need to add. But thank sorry you for the talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, sorry yeah. to hear that you had to get rid of, 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 of your supervisor and got another one. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine how, how, you know, what would have driven you to that point where you had to change the supervisor. I don't, it's not mm -hmm. easy at all. Um, no. I, I, but I always consider supervisors as the PhD students' best body. So I think our prayer should be to get a good one. Yeah. And I hope I hope that academics can actually because I I, I think I remember um, having heard this thing over and over again that there is this trend in supervision that when a supervisor had if if you are a supervisor and you had a good supervision during your PhD that you are more likely to be kinder to your to your own students when you when you get into that terrain. But if if you suffered at the hands of your supervisor. When you become a supervisor yourself, that you 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 meet out the same the same treatment to your own students. I think I've heard that theory. I don't know how true it is, but um, I think we can do better. Yeah. Thanks, Azachi. Um, Babaka, I see your hand. Thank you, Angelique. Um, thanks, um, CKZ, for this interesting um, talk. Um, um, it, it was very um, inspiring hearing you speaking about uh, your experience, and I think there is a dose of poetics in there. I mean, how you you mentioned the river that is next to your, you know, it's, it's I liked it. It's really, really poetic, and sometimes we need poetry um, to um, to help ourselves. Um, this speaks to me in, in so many ways um, uh, because I did my PhD at the University of Chantejo. Um, I, just after I, I, I came back from the US, um, from my Fulbright um, scholarship. And I lost a whole year waiting for the right supervisor because I had to, to know them all, you know. And so, because as many might know, for example, it's very difficult, especially in the Francophone University um, where doctors, doctoral students are suffering a lot, you know. Um, not only they don't have seminar, they don't have uh, uh, assistantship from this boy, but also they, you know, they're just left on their own, for example. I remember uh, when I was first year student, uh, doctor student, I wanted to, I created with one of my peers, um, a kind of a, you know, a forum where we could meet, meet to, you know, together and present our current work. And um, I personally went to the history department, to the philosophy department to invite some professors to come at the English department to, you know, to do some kind of doctoral work. It was something you know unseen before, you know, because as you might know, in our university is really disciplinary. You know, when I went to the, the history department, uh, attending some stuff, people thought I'm from the history department because I, I could talk about history stuff. So it is very disciplinary. And the thing is, but my question is, um, I think we also need, need to talk about the, the the you know 
academics as human beings first, you know? And how should we decolonize the idea of academics as being some kind of sem semi-gods, uh, you know? In, uh, at least at, at ICAD, they are really, really powerful. And I think there is a cultural, I don't know how to call it. Um, now I, I say we have the old school academics, you know, those professors and the new school. So the old school, they used to say that, you know, in order to get your PhD, uh, the paper, it has to be difficult. You know, you have to wait, you know, it should be, it should not be easy like today, for example. So I think there is a culture in, you know, there is a, there's something cultural in our, in our African cultures where seeking knowledge should not be easy. You have to suffer. It, mm. it comes a kind of a, you know, which, which is sometimes ridiculous. So I think it goes beyond, you know, academic. It goes also, it is also something really cultural. So I think, you know, um, we have also to decolonize our, 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 our relationship to knowledge seeking, which most, more often than not, we think it has to be difficult. Whereas today, you know, uh, this is something easy. We can learn from each other. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Babaka. And you, your, your, your reflections uh, are, are very spot on because uh, it reminds me of a similar experience that is going on in my home country, Nigeria. It's very common, very, very common for you to see um, that academics who have students they are supervising. And I, I've experienced this. And also there are many horrible stories of terrible supervision where professors and supervisors tell their students, masters and PhD students that the journey has to be tough. If it is not tough enough, then you're not getting the degree, that the degree should not be easy to get. And I think that is a toxic culture uh, that we have to dismantle. Um, and you are right about we needing the kind of decolonization there. I don't know if we, we, if we need to call it decolonization, but Maybe it's a, it's a kind of self decolonization. I don't know, but it, there should be a shift in the way you talk about the you talked about the old generation and new generation. But I, but 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 you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So you find that the the old paradigms are still there, very much there in in the in the academia. They have not been completely dismantled, and the old forces continue to affect what is happening currently. So I think. Uh, there is, there should be a new generational shift or movement in academia that prioritizes, um, uh, um, um, you know, that prioritizes vulnerability, kindness, compassion, humanity, and all of that, because uh, we've come a long way through uh, a toxic system that wants people to, to go through tough times and suffer. And, and do all sorts before they get a degree that is that you know that is considered that is considered um, uh, uh, you know uh, I don't know good enough. So I think uh, I don't know if this happens only in the African context. I'm interested in also knowing what happens in other parts of the world. But I have heard a lot of horrible stories that about how this happens in many African countries. And I think it's about time things change. I hope the new generation of academics that we have, that, that, you know, that we can do something to change the system. Thanks, Shikesi. We have three hands and one question in the chat. Would you like to take all of them at once and then respond to it afterwards or take them one by one? We can go one by uh, two, two each. Each time, please. Okay, Beauty and Sipiwi, um, I, I note your hands. Um, if you guys could please put on your video when asking a question or making a comment, we'd really appreciate it. Um, Beauty, you could go ahead. Hello there. Um, thank you, Chikizia, for a lovely talk. Um, I really like the part where you said you're not your PhD. That is great. And I think the one I'm taking home or taking with me is a good PhD is uh, a finished thesis. <laughs> and a great PhD is a published thesis. Hopefully we get to the published part. But, <laughs> but, but yes, it's really important to um, remove ourselves from PhD. It can be very, very um, stressful, especially those of us that are busy with it now in the pandemic, where you have a lot of external stress 
because of what is happening in the world around us. And then you also have your personal stress, which is the chapters that you need to finish and supervisors that are unavailable and all of that. So, I mean, this is a great space for us to speak about these things because I'm hoping that some of us here are supervising projects and some will um, move on to supervising PhD in future. And maybe we can just be the generation that changes things as um, someone mentioned already, because this whole thing about making students suffer too much to um, obtain a PhD, even when it's good, a supervisor also wants perfection. So um, what would you suggest that some of us that are still busy with a PhD now, how do you get to the point where you, um, what's the word I'm looking for? How do you win the battle with your supervisor who is looking for perfection? And you also have a different idea of perfection. And then you, both of you now are struggling with achieving something, but until it's satisfactory to the supervisor, um, you cannot progress. So what would you suggest? And because that also takes a toll on mental health and um, when you cannot really reach an agreement with your supervisor. Thank you for the wonderful talk. This is really useful. Thank Thanks, you. PGC Thank you, Kiwi. Mm. Um, Angelique, thank you I might take much. another one before I answer. Okay, okay. Thanks again to the speaker as well. And just for this talk, it's really, really helpful. I recently completed and yeah, I recently completed my PhD, actually just got results recently. But one of the things that came up, um, which was sparked by what Babaka said as well, was this toxic culture of suffering that I found almost became um, the thing that broke me mentally because I found that because my journey was quote unquote smooth sailing, then I started really doubting myself. I really started feeding into my mind that I'm not doctoral enough because I'm not suffering enough. So all the smooth sailing, beautiful, stunning moments that I had, I really doubted, and then that became my biggest stressor. I felt like I'm messing up, something is wrong. This is not what PhD is about. And then that almost became the crippling effect. I'm so glad my supervisor pulled me out of that and assured me that sometimes your narrative is not the general narrative because the general nar narrative I do find is a narrative of, of suffering, understandably so, because we go through a lot as PhD candidates. But I, I appreciated coming to terms with the fact that maybe, maybe I am one of the outliers where the whole process was smooth sailing and enjoyable and stunning and lovely. And that really did, did me a, a great service because then I could complete, submit, and actually believe that I am doctoral enough because at least the examiner reports also say so. So I think that the culture of suffering is really, really toxic for us. And just another quick point also on um, the isolation factor that was spoken about. There's something in my journey that I experienced was that I actually thrived on isolation and just, you know, especially physical isolation. Because what I found about myself was that during writing retreats in group settings, I actually became a bit of a disturbance to other candidates and a bit of a, you know, a bit of a problem to other candidates because of my, my very short concentration span. And I just could not concentrate in spaces with groups. So I found that I, I thrived in isolation. And then the lockdown came at a great time where I actually wrote my entire thesis in the space of 2020 during the lockdown. And I thrived in that sense. So I don't know if it's a personality thing. Can I write it off as just a personality thing um, that work, works for me? Uh, I, yeah, I would just like to hear some thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me respond to beauty first. Um, yes, perfectionism. How do you deal with perfectionism, especially when you are um, engaging with your supervisor who wants things to be a certain way? I think um, it's a bit tricky, I must say. It's a very sensitive one, especially as I, I will keep saying it because I think it's very important, you know, um, and this is, is a kind of a retrospective uh, conclusion that I have come to, that your supervisor is your best body. I do not believe in people fighting with their supervisor. I do not believe in, in, in students, you know, 
taking up uh, their supervisor as their as their enemy during the process. It will work against you. It is counterproductive. So what I would say is really, as much as we, you know, we imagine that our supervisors could be people who can uh, who can be more, you know, humane and more understanding. Uh, we also need to come to terms with with what is. It's important to acknowledge when 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 there is nothing you can do about it, but to, but also at the, at the same time find a way to work around it. Like if you are insisting on your own way, uh, and your supervisor is, is is insisting on their own way, I think you as the student will need to find a right just balance between your own ideas and his or her own ideas or their own ideas. I think it requires, that's where your wisdom and tact um, as a person, that's where you tap into your own humanity because as much as we expect supervisors to be kind and compassionate to us, also show understanding as a student because sometimes we feel entitled as, as doctoral students or research students. So also, you know, have some self-reflection about and see, try to see things in their own way. I mean, if not for anything, because of the fact that they should be experienced more than you in research, they should be, um, they are your advisors. They, they, I think they know better. And so you should be, apply wisdom. I believe that you should apply wisdom. Don't fight with nobody. Uh, don't report nobody to nobody. Um, don't, don't bad mouth them. You know, use wisdom and, and tact. and. Uh, find the right just balance. Have your own uh, aspect and bring in their own. And at the end of the day, think, and please have an honest, open conversation with them. That's what I will say. Then on the, on the issue of, uh, yes, you, you talked about Simpiwe, I think that's your name. Sorry if I, if I didn't get it right. Uh, you talked about doubting yourself doing your PhD. And I can tell you that you're not alone. You are not alone at all. It's a common, I mean, I, 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 again, something else I will say in retrospect of my PhD is that you, doubting yourself is part of it. And I think that it happened to me uh, uh, on the last year of my PhD, the year that I finished and submitted. Either the year or the year before, I started to doubt myself, to doubt the whole thing I have written, the whole argument I was making. I, I, there was this imposter syndrome. I was like, did I do a good job? Did I not? And all of that. So it is normal. I would say it is normal. When you start to feel like that, I think it's time to take a break. And I'm, I think I'm, I was also happy to hear that your supervisor helped to pull you out of that situation because it's is, is common, it's normal, and it does not mean that you didn't that you hadn't got, done a good job. It just means that you were in your head about it. And trust me, months and months and months after you have submitted the PhD or you have passed it, and, and, and all of like when you read your work, you're like, I, I mean, when I read my PhD work, I'm like, I mean, who? I mean, I, I'm like, who wrote this? Did I actually write this? Like. But during the time I was writing it, it sounded that, you know, uh, like trash. So um, just also be kind to yourself. If you find yourself in that situation where you're doubting yourself and uh, yeah, the, the, and then the isolation thing uh, that you found that was useful for you. I think it, I think like you pointed out, it, it might be a, a personality thing. Some people thrive more when they're alone. Some people thrive more when they're, when they're with people. Some people are in between. So I think um, each of us will have to know what works for us. And uh, yeah. So I'm going to take um, the last four questions or comments. Uh, we'll probably uh, go over by probably like 10 minutes. So for those who can stay, please do. Um, I'm going to read Divine's question. He asked, he said, great talk. And he wanted to know what is mental illness from your experience and do we need a PhD? And then I'll hand over to Dominique to tell us her question. 
you're muted. Yeah, always, always. <laughs> thank you, Angelique. And, and, and Chikizi, I want to, um, to Ray, thank you for your, you know, contribution and for your generosity. Um, always, you know, offering uh, your um, advice and an amazing like presentation to the to the to the doctoral seminar. So thank you for being such a, a generous colleague. Um, I I wanted to to ask you about gender dynamics, and it's a question. I know this is not necessarily your area of research, but I wanted to, um, you know, just to ask about your opinion on it because. Um, I, like the, the way you described um, the kind of um, constraint and, and norms and standards that have been um, that have been obstacles for um, uh, PhD students and scholars to seek help and 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 express themselves and express their vulnerability um, could sound in some ways very um, you know similar to you know what we I, I'm trying to be diplomatic and not to, to be to essentialize anything, but the, very often we would describe those things as you know part of you know toxic masculinity in, in the context of academia. So I, I just want to have your opinion on it. And and I know that Babaka mentioned the, the need to uh, decolonize academia in that way. Um, I also want to confirm that you know. <laughs> these kind of uh, issues also uh, are very present in, in certainly in Europe, in uh, European universities. But what, what about like um, demasculinizing, <laughs> uh, de you know, to, to, like, how to deconstruct the, the heroism of the masculine scholar and maybe find a better path to uh, mental health in that way? Uh, thank you. Um, Angelique, please, could you repeat Divine's questions? I didn't quite get them. The Divine are, sorry, um, what is mental illness from your experience and do we need a PhD? <laughs> I mean, Divine, if you want to elaborate, please hop on. Well, I think it's clear. I think it's clear. Um, well, I'm not an expert on mental illness, <laughs> but of course, um, Mental illness is is common. It's uh, it's uh, is is one of the types of illnesses that we have as humans, and it comes when we are feeling not ourselves, when we are feeling overwhelmed, when we are feeling out of sorts, when we are overburdened, and that's why people start to feel um, lonely. People start to feel depressed. Anxiety can trigger mental illness, uh, loneliness, the isolation factor for PhD students can trigger that. Um, when you start to feel overwhelmed with work and shadows, you can easily uh, you know, begin to worry and overthink, overthinking. Um, you know, people even get to the extreme point of thinking about suicides. That's really when you know that you are depressed when you are really, really, when you should really, really seek help immediately. And so mental health, I mean, uh, yeah, mental illness is, is another type of illness that we have. There's physical illness, there's spiritual illness, that is mental illness. It has to do with the mind, the, the, yeah, the mind, the illness of the mind. I think that's what I would call it. And it's, it can be triggered by stress, stress factors in our lives. It can be when we are too busy, that we are not finding time to rest enough. It can come when we are uh, worried about something, when we are um, you know, encumbered with, with life's uh, challenges, like the pandemic, isolation from social life and from people that you love and care about. All of these can trigger, because essentially we are, we are emotional beings. And if we are not getting enough of that emotional connection or uh, a sense of fulfillment from our life, from any, uh, any part of our lives, it can trigger mental illness. That is how I will answer that question. Uh, do we need a PhD? I think it's an individual question that everybody, everybody uh, can answer for themselves. But essentially, I will always tell my friends who ask me, ah, do I need to get a PhD? 
um, you know, is it going to better my my chances, you know, professionally and stuff. And one thing I would, I continue to ask them is the first question is why do you need a PhD? You have to define your why before you before you try to get one. And I always believe, I, I, I think I'm one of the people who believe that if you are not in the academy or you don't want to be an acad a, a researcher, for example, that you don't really need a PhD, unless you just want, like the title doctor, you know, just want to answer doctor, which is, you know, people, <laughs> that is as flimsy as it sounds, that's, that could be some people's uh, uh, motivation. But um, do we need a PhD? It's an individual question, depending on where you are, where, where you see yourself, your life ambitions, the discipline that you are in. Um, yeah, that's it. Dominic, thank you so much for your, for your comments. The gender dynamics. Um, in, my, in my talk, I described this kind of behavior, uh, toxic behavior in academia as uh, masochism. Masochism is this idea that you know, we have to go through suffering and, and pain and you know it's all part of it, and it's normal. Normalizing pain and suffering, and I think yeah, very much so about you know what you spoke about about the the idea of toxic masculinity. Uh, but of course, it's not only male academics that that uh, that, are, that that you know that are toxic or um, that need this you know to to you know to embrace more kindness and conviviality and compassion. Um, so, but I, I, I get what you're saying is about the, the toxicness of it that is also can be rooted to patriarchy, you know, with patriarchy, this uh, st strong sense of control or, uh, uh, you know, having people go through, you know, uh, systems of oppression that have been normalized and then it becomes difficult for us to move away from there into a more humane, convivial, a compassionate place as human beings. So I believe that all of these virtues are human virtues. They are not outside of us, they are in, inside of us. And so just like Babaka mentioned, we need to, I think that's why I like self-decolonization, if, if, we, if we could call it that. We talk about decolonization and all of these things, you know, as, as though them are the problem. We need self-decolonization, who we are, who are we beyond beyond being you know, an academic you know, or professor or a, a researcher, or whatever you are, who are you? And how do you then make, uh, use your own life as an avenue to affect lives, uh, in, in, uh, uh, you know, to, to care for other people that are not within your own sphere? So I think it's, it's, a, it's a big problem, it's, 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 a, it's a big conversation that we need to encourage more in academia. And, and, I absolutely know that it's ongoing, but we need to have it more and we need to sustain it for as long as possible until, uh, until things change for the better. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to take the last four questions. Um, Amina and then Vincent, and then I'll read Vines and I'll add mine. Is it okay to take all four with you, the final four at once? Okay, yeah. awesome. Amina? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Chikezi. Um, I have two questions. I'll make them very brief. Um, I, I'm just realizing that, you know, burnout is hard and it's really difficult to overcome. Um, and I've been thinking about this notion of how can we actually live a life that we don't have to run away from every time or that we don't sort of need holidays from if there's such a thing. Um, so I was, I was wondering, um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on where does one actually, does one ever come to a point which is possible to disconnect completely without being scared of missing out on those academic opportunities? Should we worry? Should we not? Is everything going to be okay at the end of the day? Uh, and the other question is just around thinking, I feel like once someone is a PhD candidate or a PhD student, um, there's an assumption that you're supposed to behave in a certain way, you're supposed to speak in a certain manner, and I feel like there's a lot of performance that comes into being the PhD student. Um, the way I'm thinking about it, like, I still feel like I'm a kid, right, and I still want to bring that joyfulness and that bubbliness into the academic spaces that I'm part of, and I don't want to necessarily 
sound or be serious or perform that I'm serious every single time. Um, so how do you, how did you navigate that? Or what are your thoughts on the performance that comes along with being a PhD student and does it actually impact whether or not people take you seriously? Thanks, Amina. Vincent? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chikese, for the talk. Very insightful and his position. Um, talking about postgraduate students, of course, these are human beings as well, and they are from families. I'm asking myself, um, for a PhD student with certain family responsibility, how do you navigate through that path, matching it side by side with academics, and um, maybe put the family responsibilities on hold or commitments, put it on hold, how do you strike a balance, really? Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Vincent. Um, I'm going to read Divine's response. He said, the question at Chikezi also relates to how we understand what the PhD does, why it is needed, the tensions between different ideas about what it is, and how that creates stress, pressure, depression, and triggering. PhDs also come out of the misogynist praxis praxis of academic making. Should we be changing the PhD given what we know or must we absolutely do it because we have inherited it as a way of becoming? And then Esther asked, with the method you use to protect your mental health, were you able to finish in time? And what advice would you give to those who are working full time and combining it with a PhD study? How to strike a balance? Um, yeah, those are the end of the questions and then we'll close off. Thanks, Angelic. Let me start by uh, talking about the, the, uh, the issue raised by Amina. What she described as, uh, well, fear of missing out. How do you balance fear of missing out and uh, of opportunities when you try to disconnect? Um, I think that fear of missing out, the opposite of fear of missing out is uh, joy of missing out. So instead of seeing it as fear, why don't you see it as joy? I think I've come, I have normalized unplugging from time to time and it has helped me to understand that whatever is there when I go on my break or I, I decide to disappear or, you know, um, it will always be there when I come back. I think you have to uh, make I think you have to deal with the fear. I think it's a fear. And I'm happy you called it fear of missing out. So it's a fear and it doesn't mean that it is, it is real or that there are real consequences when you unplug. I think more than anything else, unplugging in that sense helps to, for me, I see it as restoring my humanity, helping me to, uh, to prioritize what is important for now. And when I come back, when I you know, come back and I can, you know, continue from where I stopped. So instead of seeing it as fear of missing out, have joy doing it. it can be Jomo instead of FOMO. You have Jomo, joy of missing out and, and you know, missing out of opportunities. Um, well, opportunities that are meant for you, I think you, you can't miss them if you make peace with the fact that whatever is, should be yours can come to you. I don't know how, how, it, how you may not know how it happens, but uh, I think, for me, I've made peace with the fact that if I'm taking time for myself, I'm taking time for myself. And that, that is part of self-care. And whatever I miss while that is going on, well, other things will come around. And then the question of how do you, the performance that comes with being a PhD student. I think ah, I like that you call it performance because there's, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of performance you have to do. And <laughs> um. But then I would say that you don't have to lose yourself in the midst of all that performance. Uh, let that performance come from who you are, your authentic self. I think authenticity is very important even as, as a PhD student because that is what will give you, that, will, that is what will keep you grounded instead of you know, going with whatever is happening or whatever everybody has to say. 
Um, so your authenticity should should be uh, should not be lost in the in the midst of everything that is going on um, as a PhD student. So um, let your performance come from who you are, and then because somebody needs that authenticity, I believe that. I mean, personally, I believe in being myself, no matter what. Um, and not everybody is going to like you when you are when you are yourself. But insofar as I'm not being um, I'm not uh, being mean or as, uh, necessarily a difficult person, I can be myself and make peace with that because everybody is different. And, and and so make peace with being yourself, make peace with being authentic, make peace with uh, not having people like you all the time, because even if you are nice all the time, people are still not going to like you all the, all the time, right? So yeah, that's what I have to say about that. Then um, Vincent's question on how do you balance your PhD responsibilities and other responsibilities, for example, with family? Hmm. I think the best way to see the whole journey is to see it as to see your life as a pie as this big pie with slices and each slice of that pie is different aspects of your, of your life and so phd is one, one one slice family is one slice other things are you know part of the different slices of your life and so it is not family is not everything about you PhD is not everything about you, it's one component of your life. And so as much as possible, try to not uh, give in to the temptation of putting everything into one aspect while letting others suffer. Sometimes it's difficult, but you can you can do it when you, you know with practice and with wisdom, you can you can strike a right just balance um, among these responsibilities, right? And then um, Divine question of how must we do a PhD? Should we change the system of, you know, the system that warrants people to do a PhD in order to get into professional practice in academia? Hmm. I wish I know the answer to that question. I, I, I don't think I do know, but I really think that I, I find it interesting because I think that should be the way we should be thinking. I think that should be the way we should be thinking. We should, we must think about these difficult uh, issues and questions and begin to think about how we can change things. I think that would be interesting to, to begin a conversation about uh, is, is a PhD absolutely necessary to qualify one to practice an, as an academia? And what is really a PhD? How do, you know, why do we need to be a, a, do a BSc, do honors, do masters, do PhD, do this one, do, do postdoc, do this one before you come to a certain certain level of you know, um, uh, you know, academic qualification where you are now, oh, you are now a big person and then, you a scholar and then people can listen to you. I think it's an interesting question that we can, we can begin to talk about. I wish that there, there will be more conversations around it. I don't have all the answers in that, but I completely uh, 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 agree with that uh, thinking and perhaps we should think about it more. The last question about um, whether the tips I shared about how I dealt with my mental health was able to enable was helpful in in uh, enabling me to finish on time. Well, um, I began my PhD in on, officially on first July 2016, and by February 2019, I submitted my my fully written work. For external examination by April, May, the results, April, the results of the external examination came back and was successful. And I had two weeks from then to, to do corrections, minor corrections and submit back for graduation. I was supposed to graduate in July, 2019, but because I was overseas at that time, I shifted my graduation to uh, to December 2019. So if you consider that fast, well, I will agree. So that, that, but these were my dates, you know, and how I finished. But of course, tremendously, those tips I shared helped me a lot during my journey.
all of them, no one except none of them, um, uh, 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 yeah, all of them, as a as a whole, you know, contributed to my having had a, a manageable journey, and I'm I'm grateful for that. Thanks, Chikezi. I see that there's two other questions, and because I said we'll be going over 15 to 15 minutes, I'm going to ask that Eugene and Divine, maybe you guys can take that conversation offline. Um, but thank you, Chikezi, for this insightful discussion. My hope is that participants would leave here today having learned from your experience, but also that this would be the start of an even wider conversation for all of us, particularly doctoral students. As we end, I would like to alert all guests to upcoming events. Our next doctoral seminar will be held on the 18th of August, where we will have Dr. Dalf Borland presenting on pursuing an idea, the unfolding of a PhD project. And we look forward to seeing you all there. All future events can also be found on the Yuma webpage, yuma.uct.ac.za. Thanks for joining. Take care and stay safe, everyone.